Please join with me in our collect, the first prayer of the day. Come, Holy Spirit, and call us from the chaos of the world into your peaceful presence. Creator of the heavens, who led the Magi by a star to worship the Christ child, guide and sustain us that we may find our journeys in, in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We welcome you to First United Methodist Church of Florence, Alabama, as we begin this first Sunday of 2022 in worship together. Happy New Year. So let's stand and we'll sing together, We Three Kings. Let us unite together in the historic confession of the Christian faith, the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he arose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to take, live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sins before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. Good morning and welcome to First United Methodist Church here in Florence, Alabama. I'm Dale Cohen, senior pastor, and Terry has already extended a greeting to you. We're so glad that you're with us in worship today. If you're joining us online, we're grateful for your presence and want to encourage you to participate in worship in every way that you can. Uh, the words to the hymns will be on the screen and feel free to join in with all the recitations that we do. Uh, because we want you to feel a part. We'd also love to know that you're with us, and so if you could uh, go to fumcflow.org, that's our website, and click on the registration link. There you can let us know of your attendance today, or if you're on Facebook, if you just want to put in the comment section that you're here, that would be great. Those of you here in the sanctuary, I encourage you to use the connection card that's part of the worship bulletin, and you can put um, any prayer request that you have, include there, uh, because we would love to be in prayer with you this week for any concerns or celebrations that you might have. Also note that there's a place to register for Wednesday evening dinner. Uh, we do not have Wednesday evening dinner this week. We'll resume that the next week, and um, hope you'll join us for that. Next Sunday, we'll resume our full, normal Sunday morning schedule, uh, 8.15 worship, 9 a.m. family worship, uh, 9.45 Sunday school, and 11 a.m. worship, and hope you'll be able to join us for that. Today, we're celebrating Holy Communion, and anyone who desires to receive the sacrament, when we offer it towards the end of the service, you're welcome to come forward and to receive it. You don't have to be a member of this church or any church. Uh, God extends the invitation, and we just facilitate that invitation, and we would love for you to receive this symbol of God's love and God's grace. As our bicentennial year of 2022 begins, the first official event is next Sunday, January 9th. We'll honor our long relationship with the University of North Alabama. Uh, that goes all the way back to 1855 when the university or the college at that time moved from LaGrange here to Florence. And since that time, our members have served as faculty, staff, and administration, and of course, many of you are alumni. We would love for you to join us next week. We'll have special speakers and special music. The UNA Choir is going to be here, and we think it'll be a grand time of celebrating uh, wear your purple and gold, if you have it, to honor the university, and we look forward to this, our first of many events that we're going to be hosting for our bicentennial. Yesterday, the Norton Musselman class provided 145 meals through the Shoals Food Truck Ministry. That's remarkable. I want to extend my gratitude to those of you who provided food, as well as those who came up and helped prepare what needed to be prepared and, and got them in the, um, the packages to go out. Uh, this is a wonderful ministry that feeds the hungry and homeless in our area, and I'm so grateful for your generosity. Over the holidays, I'm sure you received a lot of gifts and gave a lot of gifts, uh, and gifts are important because they do express our love for one another. But I also want to encourage you not to forget to use those words. Don't just give gifts to show your love. 
but use your words to demonstrate your love for others because we live in a world in which we're becoming increasingly distant and we need to connect with one another in ways beyond just the superficial relationships that so many of us have because it is through those relationships that we get in touch with God's relationship with us. And over the next couple of weeks, I'm doing a series on the art of neighboring. We're calling it, Hey, Aren't You My Neighbor? And uh, I'm going to be giving you some tools that you can use uh, to, to become a better neighbor. And then um, after Easter, we're going to have another big emphasis on loving your neighbor uh, because I think this is important as we reconnect with one another after this pandemic. As we prepare to receive the gifts that we bring, our financial gifts, our tithes and our offerings, I want to invite Lindsay to come and to offer a prayer of dedication for our gifts. Please join me in prayer. Dear Father, in this new year, we are reminded that by your amazing grace, each day is new, fresh, and bursting with love. For this, dear Father, we praise you. You direct our paths even when we do not recognize your presence. As we set out on the journey of this new year, we wonder what challenges we may face. Please send your Holy Spirit that we may trust you completely. Direct our gifts and resources through our tithes and offerings to fulfill your will for us individually and as a community of faith. In this we ask in your holy name. Amen.
Hear the words of the gospel reading today from Luke 10, verses 25 through 37. Just then a lawyer stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, what is written in the law? What do you read there? He answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have given the right answer. Do this and you will live. But wanting to justify himself, he asked Jesus, who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, a man was going to Jerusalem from Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers who stripped him, beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down the road and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, while traveling, came near him, and when he saw him, he was moved with pity. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, having poured oil and wine on them. Then he put him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said, Take care of him, and when I come back, I will repay you whatever more you spend. Which of these three do you think was the neighbor to the man who fell in the hands of robbers? He said, the one who showed him mercy, Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Out of your word and into our hearts. May your truth take root and grow until we're overwhelmed by your love and by your grace. In Jesus' name, amen. It was about 2.30 in the morning when I heard a series of thuds and crashes right outside my window. I threw on some jeans and a sweatshirt, picked up my cell phone, and ran outside to see what was happening. At the end of the street, a car crashed into a brick mailbox and steam was billowing from the radiator. I called 911 as another neighbor checked on the driver of the car. Broken brick mailboxes with uprooted ornamental shrubs littered the path that led from up the street on down to where this car was. From practically every house in the block, Neighbors gathered out in the street to see what caused all this commotion. A teenager who'd had too much to drink was responsible for the destruction. Thankfully, he was okay, that is, at least until his parents got to him. That night changed our neighborhood. Until then, most of us knew the neighbors who lived on either side of us and, and maybe a few more from the block. However, as about 30 people stood in the street with bed hair and PJs, we met for the first time some of our neighbors, even though we had been neighbors, some for five years or more. Once upon a time, people knew their neighbors. They talked to them daily. They hosted cookouts together and went to church together. In this age of mobility and isolation, it's hard to connect with people who live right outside our front door. We have hundreds of friends on social media, yet we don't know the names of people who live on our streets. Getting to know our neighbors, though, it can be intimidating. We may only see our neighbors' cars as they drive out of the, the garage in the morning and then when they drive back in in the evening and never really see them outside of their cars. We may even prefer it that way. We're like the antagonist in Robert Frost's poem, Mending Wall, who says, good fences make good neighbors. What if we got to know the people in our neighborhoods? And what if they got to know us? Not only would we be better neighbors, but we might find that we could be really good friends. 
This idea of being a good neighbor is important because it was important to Jesus. In Matthew's gospel, another lawyer, other than the one that we just heard about, asked Jesus to recite the most important commandment. Jesus responded, love God with everything you've got and love your neighbor as yourself. The problem is we've turned Jesus' simple commandment into bumper stickers and t-shirts without putting it into practice. I guess we believe in the concept, but not enough to live it out often with those who are closest to us. In Luke's gospel, the one we heard about this morning, another expert in the law asked Jesus how he can find eternal life. Jesus answers his question with a question. He says, what does the law say? The lawyer responds, love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus commends this answer, and then he says, do this, and you will live. The problem is the lawyer was looking for a loophole because he wanted to exclude some people from his list of neighbors. So he asked another question. He said, well, then who is my neighbor? He probably wanted, wanted Jesus to say that, well, if they're faithful, law-abiding Jews, then those are your neighbors. But Jesus wasn't having any of it. Instead, Jesus describes a Samaritan man, someone who's about as far as you can get from being a friend to this lawyer, and makes him the center of a story. Samaritans were despised by the Jews because they intermarried with foreigners during one of the occupations by the Assyrians. Faithful Jews considered Samaritans religiously unclean and socially unacceptable. The Samaritan in Jesus' story encountered a traveler beaten by robbers and left for dead. And although a priest and a Levite, both devout Jews, had already passed by, It was only this Samaritan who stopped and cared for the victim. And then he took the man to a nearby lodge and and guaranteed whatever it cost to care for him that he would cover that cost. Jesus asked the lawyer in our scripture, which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? The lawyer said, the one who showed him mercy. Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. In this story, Jesus expanded the definition of a neighbor to include anybody that we meet under any circumstances. And while this parable is certainly about loving those we may not like, it's also about seeing everyone around us and loving them where they are, no strings attached. I've had neighbors whose lifestyles and values didn't align with mine. However, God requires me to love them anyway by being a good neighbor. When we fail to get to know our neighbors, we miss an opportunity to create a loving and supportive community that we all need and that we all want to be a part of. Instead, we create an atmosphere where people experience isolation. Now, I'm a very private person. I'm an introvert. I know a lot of folks find that hard to believe, but a lot of preachers are introverts. And it's easy for me when I get up in the morning and start on my way to work to keep my head down, thinking about everything that I've got to do that day. And then as soon as I get back home, you know, I'm 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 just ready to get back into the house. And in the process of that, I don't interact enough with my neighbors to get to know them or to allow them to get to know me. Poor neighboring, though, can also lead to fear. Whatever is unknown to us can be frightening. But getting to know people alleviates our fears. Fear also, though, leads to misunderstanding. When we don't know our neighbors, it's easy to misunderstand their situation 
and to make assumptions, causing us to miss out on opportunities to help them. There was a guy whose neighbor's house needed several repairs. The garage door was one of those that opened like that, and evidently the hinges were broken because the door was halfway open. The gutters were hanging off the roof, the shrubs were overgrown, and the grass was also pretty high. The house looked abandoned. So this guy did what we tend to do. He reported it to the city, and a code enforcement officer came by and ticketed the house. Well, a few days later, he was talking to one of his other neighbors about that blighted house, and his neighbor said, yeah, the woman who lives there lives alone, and her mother, who lives across town, has cancer, and she's been spending all of her time over there caring for her. And she apologized to me because she hasn't had a chance to come home and care for her house. Well, you can imagine how horrible this guy felt once he got the whole story. And to his credit, immediately he went over and he began to cut the grass and trim the shrubs and and do some repairs that he could make. But here's an important question. As a neighbor, why didn't he know her situation before? Throughout the Bible, God tells us to love our neighbors. 1 John 3.17 says, How does God's love abide in anyone who has the world's goods and sees a brother or sister in need and yet refuses to help? If we keep our heads down and our blinds closed, we'll never see our neighbors who might need us. I've got an exercise that I want us to use to help us evaluate how well we do in what's called neighboring. And there's a copy of it in the worship guide. It's a block map, and I hope you'll take some time this week to fill it out. Although the results might be embarrassing to you, at least as they were to me, however, the point of this exercise isn't to shame anyone. It's simply to help us take the great commandment from theory into practice. The box in the center is where you put either your name or your address, and then the eight boxes around that represent the houses that are closest to you. Now, I know few of us live in neighborhoods that are laid out like a tic-tac board, a tic-tac-toe board, but I think y'all will be able to figure out who your eight closest neighbors are. And then what I want you to do is there's one, two, three for each of these. In the first one, I want you to write the names. And first names are okay. If you can do first and last names, that's great. And in the second one, I want you to put some specific information that you know about that person, not something that you can observe by looking at their house, but but some information that you've got from actually having a conversation with the person. And then the third is where you'll put more in-depth information about that person, probably information that you could only get if you were socializing with that person and not just a curb conversation. You know, what are their hopes and dreams? What What is their spirituality? Things like that. Dave Runyon and Jay Pathak included this exercise in their book called The Art of Neighboring, Building Genuine Relationships Right Outside Your Door. And Dave and Jay say that in their experience of sharing this block map with many different congregations, about 10% of people can fill out names for all eight of their closest neighbors. 10%. About 3% can fill out some basic information for every home. But it's only 1% in their experience of people who can provide for all eight more detailed information about the hopes and dreams that their neighbors have. Now, I'm sure there are some folks here, you can do a lot better than that. And I applaud that. But I think most of us probably could use a little bit of work Over the next two weeks, I'm going to be sharing some specific ways that we can be better neighbors. 
all for the purpose of developing relationships that help us to engage people and meet their needs. I want to paint a picture, though, of the power of good neighboring. Many years ago, a blacksmith had a dream in which an angel said, it's time for you to take your place in God's kingdom. Well, I'm thankful God thought of me, said the blacksmith, but the planting season is just around the corner. The farmers need plows repaired and horses shod. Could I put off taking my place in the kingdom until I've completed all of that work? The angel thought it a fair request and granted it. But before long, the angel appeared again. A neighbor is sick right here in the middle of planting season, said the blacksmith. And so, do you think eternity could hold off a little longer? If I don't finish planting my neighbor's field, then his family is going to suffer. The angel smiled and vanished. And whenever the angel appeared, the blacksmith always pointed to a neighbor who needed some help and how he was going to help that neighbor. But several years later, the blacksmith felt old and tired. And so he prayed one evening, Lord, I'm tired and I'm old. I think I'm ready to go. And no sooner had he prayed that prayer than the angel was there. And the blacksmith said, if you'll still have me, I'm ready to take my place in God's kingdom. The angel just let out a little bit of laugh and said, where do you think you've been living all along? That's the idea of neighboring, is that the image that we have of the kingdom of God, we bring to our neighborhood, that we have that kind of influence, that we have that kind of impact, where when people come to live close to us, they get a glimpse of the kingdom of God. Jesus said, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. I look forward to exploring more ways of being the best neighbors that we can be so that we can create God's kingdom here on earth. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen and amen. As we prepare to receive the sacrament of Holy Communion today, Terry is going to meet me here at the altar, and I invite you to turn in your worship guide to the great thanksgiving. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you. Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, you formed us in your image and breathed to us the breath of life. And when we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign God, and spoke to us through the prophets. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy holy Lord, Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. Your Spirit anointed him to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to announce that the time had come when you would save your people. He healed the sick, fed the hungry, and ate with sinners. 
By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water in the Spirit. When the Lord Jesus ascended, he promised to be with us always in the power of your word and Holy Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, he gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples, and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, With the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now with the confidence of children of God, let us pray together. Our Father, Father, who who art in heaven, heaven, heaven be thy thy name. Thy Thy kingdom kingdom come, thy thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. heaven. Give us this this day day our daily daily bread. bread. And And forgive us our trespasses, trespasses, as as we we forgive forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Because there is one loaf, we who are one body, for we all partake of the one loaf, the bread which we break is a sharing in the body of Christ. And the cup over which we give thanks is a sharing in the blood of Christ. Amen. I invite those who are going to assist to come forward at this time. And as they're coming forward, let me share with you the way we receive the sacrament here is Terry and I will be standing down here at the altar rail and we'll tear off some bread and place it in your hand and then you can dip it in the cup. If for any reason you're uncomfortable with that, we have these individual servings Uh, It's a two-system tear-off where the top layer uh, exposes the wafer and then the second layer exposes the juice. And if you receive the sacrament that way and you just want to take it and kneel at the altar to receive it or take it back to your pew, whatever you're most comfortable with. We don't want any barriers to the sacrament. This is God's gift of grace to each and every one of us and we want you to receive this blessing. The ushers will direct folks here in just a moment, and um, I want to encourage you to come expecting God to show up in the sacrament, because He is among us in the breaking of the bread and in the sharing of the blood.
body of Christ, he died for you. The body of Christ, he died for you. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself for us. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves for others. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. May we all today commit to this new year, 2022, living for Jesus every day, in every way, everywhere we go. And all of God's people said... Amen.